Um, hello. So I'm going to give a presentation on the, uh, the status of our above ground biomass. All right. So I'll, I'll sort of set the stage with the Jedi above ground biomass approach. I'll talk about the forest structure and biomass database, uh, which underpins our calibration validation program for Jedi. Uh, the, uh, just an overview of our pre-launch footprint biomass estimators, and then I'll talk about the Jedi on orbit data and how we're and how we're, not, how we're using those data in our post-launch Calval program to get our level 4A footprint of ground biomass product ready for release. So <clears throat> this is a conceptual diagram of our overall biomass approach for Jedi. We have, we have collected a lot of in-situ plot data uh, around the world. That database has grown progressively over the past couple of years. Each, I think each silver laser or forest set we present the same map again and it's a bit better each time. Um, we combine these with coincident airborne LiDAR data which we simulate Jedi waveforms. Uh, these are then divided up into prediction strata, calibration and prediction strata which we use to train models globally. So for Jedi, for prediction strata we've combined plant functional type and, con and continental region as a set of um, prediction strata for our models. Um, if we get any more specific, uh, we, in terms of local models, we can start around the data easily. Um, once we have these models and we can apply them to on all the data, which I'm talking about today, they will then feed into the one kilometer estimation of mean above ground biomass and the standard error of that mean like Ralph talked about today. And I think Svetlana will talk about the methods behind that a bit more on her talk. So it's the current status of our forest structure and biomass database. The size of the circle is proportional to the number of Jedi simulated footprints and institute biomass estimates we have. The orange is the private data, the blue is the publicly available data. Um, so as you can see, look, European data and Asian data in particular is, is all private. We have private data use agreements for that. Um, with that process, all that data has gone through a fairly rigorous QA, QC process and we've filtered what we consider poor quality data or data with geolocation effects and other uh, problems that would cause us problems in our calibration. Um, at the end of that process, we have 0.0625 or 25 meter estimates of biomass and simulated Jedi waveforms. We've also aggregated the data to force resolutions, 0.25 hectare and 1 hectare data, which we're using in some of our cell light fusion uh, research. On the right there, you can see the distributions of above ground biomass for each continental region. The yellow is the private data, the blue is the public. Um, something notable is Asia in particular is a major data gap for us. The data we have in Southeast Asia is from private and continental and continental Asia we just basically have almost no data at all. So it's a big target for us in the future if we're going to update our biomass calibrations globally. So our footprint biomass estimators, I, I, we have an individual estimator um, for every single combination of region and uh, PFT. I just picked these two because it's two that we're actually focused on in some of our cabal at the moment. So this is the US deciduous broadleaf tree at the top and South America um, evergreen broadleaf tree at the bottom. I think Laura showed the US one this morning. So when we're developing these models, it's purely data driven. Um, the, selection of model, the selection of model variables and the selection of the transformation of the response or the predictive variables um, goes through an exhaustive selection process um, within prediction strata defined by PFT and continent. We do allow, where it's going to improve the quality of predictions, we do allow the model fitting strata to be more generalised than the prediction strata. Often that's required due to the paucity of data. Uh, the distribute, we, an assumption of our gridding, above, our approach to gridding above ground biomass, our parametric inference framework, requires that our footprint level models are unbiased. It's a key assumption. And so we go through, we pretty closely examine the distribution of model residuals, model residuals and we have some tests in there to ensure that the models that we select do meet that criteria as best as we can. And then we actually get a set of candidate models, all of which are suitable at the end, and which ones we choose are actually driven by theoretical 
um, consideration um, based on the selected variables that are in there, the level of parsimony of the model. I just also want to point is that as well as using cross-validation for assessing model performance, we, our model selection process is driven by something called geographic transferability. Basically, we take non-random selections of the data and evaluate how models perform where there is no calibration data in that area. It sort of helps general, make the models as generalizable as possible for areas in which we're lacking data. Um, but now we're transitioning from pre-launch into post-launch. This is an animation of the Jedi data that's been acquired on a week-by-week -week basis. So due to various problems, some weeks are better than others, but um, this represents about uh, three months of data that you can see looping through, the data that's been collected week to week. Uh, we do have gaps in data in some areas that we're trying to fill, like Eastern China. Um, seems to have a lot of gaps at the moment. But generally, all these shots represent what we consider good shots. The signal to noise is sufficiently good to penetrate up to 95% canopy cover, it's land surface and cloud free. Now, that calibration database I said before, that is coincident in situ and airborne LIDAR, but a lot of the airborne LIDAR we have in that database is actually far more expansive. And so as we get more and more as the Jedi data comes in, we intersect it with those sites and we use that airborne LIDAR to co-locate the Jedi waveforms with the airborne LIDAR. <laughs> and this is critical for a number of our cover activities, particularly validation of the Jedi waveform simulator, uh, in future linking the in-situ data. But you can see this map here, the size of the, the, size of the surface proportional to the area of the LIDAR and the colour proportional to the number of intersected Jedi footprints. Uh, we've gone through a process of co-locating all these footprints. We've successfully co-located about 17% of them so far, which corresponds to 178,000 uh, coincident footprints. We're sampling across a whole range of geographic regions globally, and we're getting a good sampling across the range of cover and slope, which are major drivers of uncertainty in our ground finding. Here's a couple of example simulated, observed and simulated waveforms. On the left here, you have what we call a bullseye plot. And so this basically tells you what the X and Y offset is between the simulated waveform that we consider to be the match to the Jedi and the actual Jedi waveform. And this comparison of airborne LIDAR allows us to um, account for that mismatch. So in this case, the offset was 13 meters, 43, 20. I really need to note this is not indicative of level final Jedi performance. Um, this is what we call rapid geolocation data. So it's very shortly after acquisition, uh, we get data delivered to UMD that has rapid geolocation applied. It's tens of meters error instead of uh, um, less than 10, but it's sufficient to allow us to co-locate with airborne LIDAR. Uh, so again, there's an observed that I work for. He's a simulator. At the moment, we're updating the simulator to update the mean estimates of noise, the standard deviation of that noise, the shape and um, length of the transmitted pulse, and also the footprint size. So all those parameters are updating actual Jedi data now, and that's gonna feed into post-launch calibration of our footprint biomes estimators and improve those. Here's another example um, that we have here. I just wanna, of the, all the matches that we've done, we've, we have a quality filter. We've, we're only using intersections, 38% of beam tracks that have a, 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 a mean correlation greater than 0.8 and at least 40 footprints coincident along that beam. We compute a separate offset for each Jedi beam. Uh, we do get a lot of mismatches due to false peaks sometimes, but it's often driven by a date mismatch between the airborne LIDAR and the and the Jedi data. So contemporaneous data is really important. Um, and so I do want to stress that uh, we are getting, we are building up a very solid post-launch KVL database that will feed into level two and four products. But if we can, if you are collecting recent LiDAR data and we can target data that hit those, that would be very useful for us. Um, our CowVal at the moment, on our level two and almost level four A products is very focused on Elvis because we've been able to acquire those coincident with Jedi orbits that are cloud free um, and very close in time. 
And so in May this year, we undertook campaigns with three types of acquisitions. Um, we had long orbital underflights greater than 1,000 kilometres for all Jedi Bank configurations um, that were like 1,000 kilometres long, which is about the, the long wavelength of our geolocation error. We've also done east-west transects. That's along single orbit lines. We've also done east-west transects greater than 1,000 kilometres. And what that does is sample a whole range of Jedi orbits at different times of day, different epochs during the mission, and will gradually build up footprints and diversify our Cavell data. And then also large area mapping boxes over established ground monitoring sites, uh, such as Costa Rica, uh, where there's been Elvis data acquired two times previously. We've got 20 years of change there that can help underpin um, our sort of use of Jedi for assessing carbon fluxes and accumulations. Um, we've also targeted some of the NEON sites, or what, a NEON site in particular, the Kawita Elto site and the Oak Ridge site. Uh, we're coordinating with the NICE uh, team on that because they're using those sites for their campaign as well. Um, a lot of our cowbell at the moment, we're, a lot of us are in the trenches at the moment doing this. Uh, we're very focused on this particular, these particular long transits to Elvis, which uh, um, have underpinned the route, some of the results Ralph showed today, validating the level one and two products. Um, here's an example of uh, one waveform from that this orbit 1850 here that has been processed to level two. So you can see where the canopy top has been detected, where the ground's been detected, and the lowest peak, lower signal detection and the cumulative distribution of energy between those peaks. And the heights at which different fractions of that energy uh, intersect gives us our relative height metrics, which underpin our level 4A calibration. Uh, these are also underpinning the level 2B product, our footprint cover and vertical profile metrics. These are producing another set of predictors that are very useful for biomass estimation. We're not currently use them, but we do plan to um, bring them back into the process in our post-launch evaluation. So the level 2B product will include canopy and ground waveforms that have been unmixed. We've separated them. Uh, we'll use that to estimate the directional gap probability profile. And from that, we can estimate the vertical uh, plant area volume density profile. Uh, so biophysics, so these are light up the seed metrics, direct metrics of height and elevation. And these are the more biophysical metrics, which are represented the level 2B product. And then we can use those to estimate and to get an estimate of above ground biomass uh, for this example. And so we want it to be, the level 4A product is not, it's not due for release until 17 months after launch. At the end of at the end of November, we will be releasing the level one and level two products. Uh, but we do plan to release the level four eight products earlier. We just, we just need to get through this kind of our process for that, for that level of product. But this is an area where we're testing some of our biomass predictions at the moment. So this is all but 1850 coming down here. Um, that's the same waveform I showed before. Um, as you see, it's very high sensitivity cloud-free data along that Elvis path, which has been very useful to us. There's other, here's another orbit going across here. You can see the sensitivity is very low here, uh, which would be atmospheric attenuation or complete interception by cloud. And this is just the, uh, one of our test distributions of buffer and biomass in this region that we've, dealt, that we've developed in our testing. So conclusions and next steps. Um, we're in the midst of validating the Jedi Waveform Simulator, as Ralph just said earlier. It's, this is critical um, to underpin uh, estimation of biomass from spaceborne LiDAR, um, and that will feed through into our post-launch calibrations of those products. Uh, we, we're looking at space, actually in coordination with the other missions, but specific for the Jedi Forest Structure and Biomass Database, we're looking at the spatial representativity this analysis is, will underpin where we target future fuel campaigns. I think that would lead to the biggest improvement in our products, which is ensure we, we fill gaps in our data coverage that are not currently re, um, well, well represented in our calibration. Um, we're also using intra, what we call intromission comparisons to improve, um, to underpin the Calval of some of our daytime and coverage beam data. This is where orbits intersect 
and we can actually build up a database where we get very closely intersecting Jedi shots, and that can help us um, assess the performance of the weaker, lower signal-to-noise data relative to the very high signal-to-noise data. And Laura Duncanson is leading, along with Matt Disney from UCL and myself, a CSLPV best practices validation protocol for above-ground biomass, and the recommendations in there will lead to um, and a, a sort of a community accepted approach for, for validation of the gridded biomass products. Um, not, but we do not need that for Jedi at the moment. Post-launch CalVal activities, um, as I've shown, the pre-launch calibration of footprint biomass estimators are complete. The, the forest structure and biomass database continues to expand post-launch. Um, the calibrations will be updated. Um, so we, we haven't stopped, we're still going. And so if you, particularly if you've got new acquisitions underway, particularly coincident with JEDI, please talk to Ralph or Laura, Suzanne, myself, anyone from the JEDI team. Uh, we'll be very interested. Uh, we are planning ground campaigns to support the Elvis acquisitions, but also target in situ data gaps. Um, but that's in the planning phase at the moment. And as I said, the priority for JEDI acquisitions to date has been basically maximizing our geographic coverage, but we're now getting to the we now can think more about targeting individual sites. Um, we are tar looking at targeting uh, some of our LiDAR sites for improving the geolocation, but again, um, we are very interested in uh, high value, large area LiDAR CalVal sites that can help improve the JEDI products. Um, so thank you, that's it.